I'm going to invite everyone to stand. One of the things we do here at All Souls is we stand for the reading of God's Word. And so we're going to read together from His Word from Psalm 23. So hear now God's Word. The Lord, Yahweh, is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my very soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I'm going to invite Matt to come on up here. And uh, for the record, I'm going to just note that I never get applause like that when I come up to preach. Friends, yeah, neither does Tommy or Charlie for that matter. But friends, we are um, just delighted to have our brother Matt. Uh, for those of you who are here visiting, um, my name's Will. I'm the lead pastor here, and we are super thrilled to have you joining with us this morning. Today is a special day because it's a day that rep represents the culmination of many, many lives pouring into one. And then through this one, pouring into many, many others. It's the way God designed life to work. And the simple fact that you're here, if you're here to see Matt, um, you know what that means. Because you've tasted and seen the sweetness, the grace, and the love of God through this young man. And we believe God has put an anointing on him, that God has called him to be a minister in a unique way that includes his words and his huge heart. And Matt has resisted that from day one, uh, but we have forced him to be here today. Um, um, They're not lying. <laughs> and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for Matt. Let me, let me pray for us, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive in. Jesus, we are just incredibly grateful that you are who you are, the shepherd that comes and finds the lost sheep. For as we have, have, as we have already sung this morning and as, Lord, we are about to hear more of, that's who we are, sheep. And so I pray that, Lord, you would put your anointing, your hand on this sheep, on Matt, and that the words that come out of his mouth would be yours first and foremost. As you have fed him all week and all month long, Lord, would, would the, the, the meal that we eat today be saturated with that grace and, and that intimacy. Jesus, we don't want to know about empty religion. We don't want to know about going to church. We want to know you. We want to know you. For there is nothing greater. There is no one beside you. And so we ask that you would come close and that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would pour in here. That we would have ears to hear like we've never heard before. And eyes to see what we've never seen before. And Jesus, make your glory and your face great to us and use this broken instrument to that end. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thanks, brother. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, thank you. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everybody here and thank you very much to all the people I invited who I now see in the crowd. Just seeing all of your faces, whether it's the whole thing or just half, really does make me feel loved, and I appreciate you. And even those watching online, thank you for joining me here today. I'd like to start off pretty much on the same note with a very, very sentimental message. Sheep are stupid. <laughs> the end, you may go on. <laughs> <No. laughs> It seems like a pretty random message, but the reason I like to emphasize it, the reason I say it in the first place, is because we just said Psalm 23. And Psalm 23 starts off with a very poetic message that many of us say and don't really understand. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Now, if you want to understand that, you have to understand first how stupid sheep are and why they need a shepherd. You see, the funny thing about Psalm 23 is it was written by a shepherd, David. And what he understood was that he himself is nearsighted. He's impatient. He's worrisome. He's rebellious, ill-mannered, and easily distracted. But if you still don't understand how stupid sheep are, if it works, I would like to play a funny video for you just to kind of paint that picture a little more. And if it doesn't work, it's all right. Okay, it's fine. You know what? We'll show it to you later. (laughs) It's okay. We love you. Well, what happens in the funny video, I'll just describe it. Pretty much, there's a little boy who's taking this sheep very gently, very heroically from this crack in the rock that they're walking on. And so he struggles for a long time, finally gets the sheep out, and the sheep gets out, and it shakes itself off, and it runs, and it prances in the light, and then falls right back into the crack. (laughs) And I love that, because we get to see, like I said before, sheep are stupid. But like David understood, not only are sheep stupid, but we are stupid, all of us. And we need a shepherd because every time we walk on our own, every time we do what we feel is right and follow our own intuition, our own desires and passions, it only ever ends up hurting us. So, some of you may not really like what I just said. You want to lead your own life. You want to be your own person. And you may think, I don't need a shepherd. I don't need God as my shepherd because I am my own shepherd. I'd like to challenge that idea. No matter who we are or what we think we're doing on our own, we're being led by our passions and our desires. And everything that we let lead us that's not God only ever ends up failing us. Bear with me. I have small ears and that doesn't help. But one thing that we let lead us can be emotion. If I'm happy, I'm successful. And a funny thing about that is it seems great at first. Happiness is amazing. But sometimes we will bring other people down and not consider their emotions just so that we can have the emotions we look for. Or even better, if happiness is success, then what do we do when we're in circumstances that make happiness impossible? Emotions fail us or money. Now, money in itself is not a bad thing, but when you let it lead you, when it becomes your everything, when it becomes your shepherd, it only ever fails you. And here's why. Money can be control. Money can be stability. If I want something and I have enough money to get it, bless you, then I get it. But what happens when we find ourselves with a problem that money can't fix? or status. This one is probably one of my favorites because for the others, I may have been talking to some of you and maybe it resonated. This one is right, right here. This is me all the way. I'll expose myself. I followed status for a very long time because it feels really good, and some of you know, to walk through the high school hallways and see everybody and everybody knows me. The students, the teachers, the lunch ladies, the coaches, the nurses, the custodians, everybody loves me. And that fills me with such a high. It feels great until there's that one person who doesn't. You know, that one teacher I can't please or that one student who doesn't sing my praises. My favorite artist, Lecrae, puts it this way. When you live for others' acceptance, you die from their rejection. And over the past two years, I've learned what this meant in a completely different way as I've been rejected one way after another. Even status fails us when we put it as our leader. Now, good news is we don't have to be led by these things. We have a good leader if we follow him, and his name is Jesus. Our God is the shepherd that leads us to life. And I'll express that in two points. One, 
our God is a good shepherd, and two, what it means to follow him. And so first, our God is a good shepherd. How do we see that? Well, one way we can see it is that he provides for his people. In Psalm 23, verse 1, we said, I shall not want. I don't even know what shall means. I don't think anybody really looks into this and, and gets what I shall not want means. It simply means I have all that I need. I'm satisfied. It's as if you're at a feast or an all-you-can-eat buffet, and you're getting good food, and more and more good food. But there comes a point where you don't want any more, where your tummy is happy, and you shall not want. We see God's provision a lot in the Old Testament. We see it when he leads his people Israel out of Egypt. We see it in so many stories, in so many ways, it's crazy. He provides water from a rock. He provides enough quail or birds to feed all of Israel for a month. You see, God provides over and over and over for his people. But one of my favorite stories of that provision is the story of Elijah. Raise your hand if you know the story of Elijah. Not everybody. It's pretty famous, but more than I thought. The story of Elijah is... Elijah is a very holy man, to the point where if he says something, in God's name, it happens. And he lived during the time of King Ahab of Israel, who was not a good person, to say the least. Some of you may not know Ahab, but you'll know his wife, Jezebel. And so Elijah goes to confront Ahab and Jezebel. He says, you are doing a wicked thing in God's eyes. And because of that, I will punish you by not letting it rain until I give the word. And so the skies shut until Elijah said that it would rain again. But I like to kind of rewind that because, you know, it's the Bible. And sometimes we just hear the Bible. and We're like, okay, that happened, that happened, that happened. No, I stop. That hits me because I'm like, hola, 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 Elijah. I get you on some extent. You know, Israel will feel like the wrath and they won't have rain. But if I was Elijah, I'd be like, I wouldn't shut up the whole sky. You know what I mean? I need that rain too. But what am I going to do? How am I going to drink water? How am I going to feed myself? How am I going to eat vegetation if there's no water? But like we said, God provides for his people. And so God instructed Elijah to go to a brook. And at that brook, he would not only have water from the brook, but he would be provided food by a raven, a bird. (laughs) A raven would bring bread and meat twice a day, every day that he needed. He had flying food delivery service. (laughs) That's something you can't, I don't know, I, could, I couldn't ask for better than that. But there came a time, since it wasn't raining, that the brook dried up. And so if God was anything like, sorry, if Elijah was anything like me, he'd be like, oh no, what do I do now? But he doesn't. He listens to God. And God tells him, go to the house of this widow. And now a widow at this time was in a much more desperate situation than most of us can imagine. You see, being a widow back then meant your main provider was gone. And not only was her main provider gone, but she was in the middle of a drought. And so when Elijah meets this person that God said, I want you to go to her, she'll provide your meals, she'll provide your housing. When Elijah meets this person, she's in such a desperate situation that she's getting ready to eat her last meal before her and her son die. I've never been in a situation like that, but I can't imagine how hopeless she must have felt knowing that it was all over after this. But either way, Elijah comes up to her and he says, Before you cook for yourself with whatever you have left, which, by the way, was a handful of flour and that little bit of oil at the bottom of the jug, that's all she was going to eat with her and her son. 
But Elijah says, before you cook that for yourself, make some for me. And then afterwards, you can make something for yourself. Sorry, excuse me here. Then afterwards, you can make something for yourself. And watch. The oil and the flour will not run out in God's name. And so, out of faith, she obeys. She makes this little cake for Elijah. And then she makes some food for herself and her son. And the flour and the oil does not run out. It's exactly as Elijah said it would happen. And so God not only provided for his prophet, Elijah, but for this widow as well. Another part of our God being a good shepherd is that he gives peace. Now, a lot of us, when we think peace, we think of vacation. Right now, we're in summer vacation. And that's not wrong, but it pales in comp- com- <laughs> can't speak, sorry. But it pales in comparison to the peace that God gives. And here's why. Raise your hand if you've ever gone on a family vacation that's gone perfectly according to plan. <laughs> wow, I see hands. That's surprising. That's going to change. No, this is what I mean. I mean, the kids were behaved the whole time. Not one argument broke out. The weather was perfect, and there were no late flights. (laughs) If anybody has ever gone on a trip like that, take me with you. (laughs) But even if there was a trip like that, it would pale in comparison to the peace God gives. And the reason is because God does not have to wait until your summer vacation to bring peace. The verse 23, verse 2, and part of 3, says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And so, yes, there are times of vacation. There are times of circumstances that are good. But if you look two verses later, it says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, doesn't really sound like a picture of peace now, does it? I mean, on one end, it's, he leaves me beside still waters. And then it's the valley of the shadow of death. And then it's green pastures. And then it's the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't get much worse than that. But like I said before, our God gives peace not because of our circumstances. We serve a God who gives peace in the valley of the shadow of death. And the way he does that is through his presence. You see, God's presence brings peace, and God is present always. Can you say that? God is present always. That was weak. God is present always. The reason he's present always is because of the helper of the Holy Spirit that he sent to be with us when Jesus died, rose, and ascended into heaven. That was a lot. Something about a helper and a a died and a spirit and something. That was a lot. Maybe some of you need need me to slow that down a bit. So let's start with who Jesus was, who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God who came down to earth in flesh to be the Savior of the chosen people of Israel and the whole world. You see, he spent a lot of his adult life preaching about the kingdom of heaven, performing miracles, healing the sick, and obeying his Father's will. And even being that perfect person, he had enemies. The religious leaders, people with influence, hated him enough not only to have him captured, but to even have him killed. But little did they know, that was part of his plan all along. You see, the Israelites had this ritual, this thing that they did where they would sacrifice an innocent, spotless lamb. They'd literally slaughter this sheep, and in so doing, pretty much say, God, I have sinned against you, and this is what I deserve. But you are merciful and you are kind, and you give me another chance, and you transfer my punishment onto the sheep who doesn't even deserve it. 
Jesus came not only to live a perfect life, but to take that punishment for us. Everything that our sin deserves, he took on himself. And so he let himself be captured. And he let himself be killed on a cross. He died so that you, so that you, so that you and you can have a spot in heaven and stand before the, the Father. That's why he calls himself the good shepherd. See, John 10 says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. If anybody knew what that meant, it was him. But that's not the end of the story. In fact, three days later, he raises from the grave to claim authority over death itself, the biggest enemy of mankind. And after he rises, he speaks to some of his disciples, telling them, it is time for me to go and prepare room for you guys in heaven. And so Jesus is leaving the earth, but our hope is not lost because Jesus says he was going to send his helper or the Holy Spirit to be present with us. And so the Holy Spirit is present always. And the Holy Spirit isn't just some random ghost no, the Holy Spirit is the one that empowered the disciples and empowers us to understand what God is saying, to speak in tongues, to preach in boldness, to pray more effectively. And the Holy Spirit is also the reason why we can have peace in the valley of the shadow of death. Maybe there are some of you who hear that and say, I want that. I want to be led no longer by myself, by my the desires that fail me, but by a good shepherd who would lay down his life for me. And so what does that look like? Well, on one end, it's what we have to do. John 14, Jesus says that in order for us to please him, in order for us to do what he is calling us to do, in order to follow him, we have to love and obey the Father. But more than what it looks like on our end, what can we expect in return? Justice and gentle guidance. Psalm 23, verse 4 says, Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What the heck does that mean? Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, if you've been following, you'd see that this whole psalm, at least the first four verses, is all about David being a sheep and God being the shepherd. And now a shepherd would use a rod and a staff. A rod was used violently to correct wrongdoing. If the, if the sheep would go out of line and do something that the shepherd really did not like, in order to teach them, he would strike them. But the staff was a gentle stick that was used to just apply a nice force, a small, slight pressure to the side of the sheep if they're going astray. You see, I see why the staff would be comforting as a sheep, you know? Oh, it's that gentle pressure, and it's leading me in a good direction. A staff was like the equivalent of bumpers in a bowling rink, you know? Like it saves you from the embarrassment of getting a gutter ball, but it gets you right back on the right track. It reminds you that your shepherd loves you and has good intentions for you. But what about the rod, though? Like, if that's the violent thing, I wouldn't say I'm comforted by it. You see, the rod was authority. It's God's authority, his justice, his tough love. And sometimes that tough love can feel like God slamming a door in your face. Imagine saying, oh, I'm so happy you slammed that door in my face, God. My nose isn't broken at all. Like, it's crazy. Or I'm so happy that relationship I used to cherish so dearly just crumbled right in front of me. Why would David be comforted by this rod? Well, there's two theories I have. One, he's crazy. <laughs> I'm just going to outright say it. He enjoys pain. That's not what I think it is, though. I'd say the more likely answer 
is the reason he loves this rod is because he wasn't the last one to get hit with it. <laughs> to put it in other words, who here had a scary mama? You don't have to raise your hand, but scary mamas exist. I have a scary mama right there. <laughs> Another scary mama somewhere. I have a bunch of scary mamas. If you don't have one, go get yourself one. <laughs> but nothing was scarier than when I was a kid and I would do something wrong and my mom would look at me with those eyes, those crazy eyes that just said, are you going to get the belt or are you going to make me get it? And I knew I was in for something. But what about when the heat wasn't on me? What about when one of my brothers would do the heinous act of stealing my apple juice and my mom, my crazy, scary mom, would be against them, defending me? Well, then I wasn't scared at all. Then I'd sit back and laugh. You see, David understood that like a scary mama, God is just. He doesn't just like to hit his sheep. He doesn't just use the rod against the sheep. He uses the rod to correct evil. And that meant protection from all of the sheep's enemies. When wolves, when bears, when lions would come, that is what he used to protect them. And David understood that as long as he was faithful to God and had no evil in himself, that rod meant protection from all of his enemies. And he had many. But let's just focus on one. Who here has heard the story of the rock and Goliath? <laughs> I saw hands go up. They went down real quick. <laughs> Not this, the rock, although that would be an interesting fight. That rock. Okay, so maybe some of you aren't familiar with the story. The story of the rock and Goliath goes like this. Israel is at war with the Philistines, and now there's this giant Philistine named Goliath, and he's really scared. And... He's pretty much saying, nobody can stand against me. And all of Israel is like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> and they're cowering in fear. But then this one rock gets up and says, you're not going to scare me and my people. I'm going to fight you. I don't know why rocks sound like that, but they do. And he gets in a sling and he launches himself at Goliath. It's a silly story. That's not the story at all. For those of you who know, it's actually the story of David and Goliath. Rocks don't launch themselves. And they don't speak most of the time. But watch this. I'm about to blow your minds. Y'all ain't ready. <laughs> What's the difference between David and the rock? He understood that there was none. And here's why. When he was going to face Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 37, these are his words. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Ooh, that hits. The Lord who delivered me, that's, that's beautiful for many reasons. But in the same way, a rock can't launch itself. A rock is nothing without a sling. In the same way, the sling is nothing without the wielder David understood that he is nothing, he is powerless without the God who delivers even Goliath into his hands. And so, yeah, David understood the might, the power, the protection of the rod. But why wasn't he scared, though? Isn't it, it sounds like I answered my own question. Yeah, he understood the protection and the power of the rod. And in a way, I did. But there's more to it. Okay, he understood who God was. He understood God was fighting for him, and so he wasn't scared. What about the other Israelites? Why were they scared? Well, the answer there is kind of similar, too. Because Goliath was there. You see, fear comes from focus, not just our circumstances. The Israelites and David were in the same situation, but the Israelites were scared and David wasn't. Here's why the Israelites were scared. <laughs> To put Goliath in perspective, he was over nine feet tall. His coat of scale armor was over 120 pounds. That's like the weight of my little brother. And that's just his coat. And then the tip of his spear, the spearhead was over 15 pounds. That's not even the whole thing. 
just the head of it. What do you think the Israelites were focusing on? I see why they were scared. But what was David focused on? David was focused on God's past provision. All the times God had protected him before, from the lions, from the bears. And David understood something that so few of the Israelites understood, and so few of us, myself included, don't understand. He understood that when you walk with God long enough, troubles get boring, (laughs) or at least they really should. In Joshua 24, Joshua, who's the new leader after Moses, does a recap to remind all of Israel all the ways in which God had provided. And not just any kind of provision, but all the ways God had defeated their enemies. And so it goes on with a long list of people, and to be honest, it gets boring. The reason it gets boring is because you're like, okay, they fight the Egyptians, and then they win, and then they fight the Amorites, and then they win, and then they fight the Moabites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and it goes on and on, and it gets boring because you already know what's going to happen. And at one point, God starts showing off. Like, in one, in one instance, he doesn't only use the Israelites' swords and shields and make them win by their own brute force. He sends hornets. He's like, I don't even need y'all. I could do this all day. You know, behind the back, like over the window, over the river, like off the glass swish. You already know what's going to happen. That made no sense. But either way, if you know the Michael Jordan and Larry Bear commercial where they're playing horse and everything they, go, everything they do goes in, then you can kind of relate to how funny or crazy it is how God provides in so many different ways. But to give a different example for maybe some people closer to my age, who here has ever watched One Punch Man? Raise your hand. Ah, favorites. I love you guys. If your hand's not up, eh. (laughs) You had your chance. But the reason I love this show is because it's, it's like a spoof of other animes. The whole point is the protagonist is so wildly overpowered that he beats everybody in, you guessed it, one punch. And so over and over and over, there's this unnecessary drama where all the side characters and everybody else in the show will be like, oh, there's this new enemy. He's scary. Look at what he did to everybody else. He he beat his own sensei. He's a monster. I don't know if one one punch man can take this guy. But then the episode comes to a close. They finally confront each other. And one punch man beats him in one punch. And you just sit there slapping yourself in your head like, should have seen that coming. But then it happens for 20 more episodes, and that's the season, and it gets you every time. (laughs) In which case, we're a lot like those Israelites, aren't we? You see, God had provided for them so many times, yet they still forget because all they do is focus on the giants in front of them. Now, fear, pain, stress, it doesn't mean God hasn't provided. It just means we also let ourselves forget. So take a minute. I want you to think, what is it right now that just, that you don't want to think about? That giant that you're facing that hurts, that you know you're powerless over? If it's coming to your mind, that explains the serious stares. You don't want to think about it. But just like you thought about that, I want you to think about God's past provision. Think about the times where God has done the impossible in your life. Things that you knew could not just be coincidence. Think about it. And then I'll share a story where I've seen that in my own life. answer to prayer. If you guys don't know that knucklehead in that photo next to me, you better get to know him soon. There was a time where months ago, during my first semester of college, which was online, where 
Pastor Will asked me to read a couple of verses, you know, nothing crazy, just to start the sermon off. And I was free, and I'd prayed about it, and I felt like, yeah, God's telling me to do this, and so I did it. But when God puts you on stage, Satan doesn't like that. And so he attacks. And that day I felt it in a way I don't think I've ever felt it before. And I had thoughts and ideas that were all types of wrong. I went home and I faced an anxiety so big and I had no idea where it was coming from. But it was so bad that it got me to curl up in a ball on my bed in tears. And in that I prayed. I said, God, help me. I need you to come close. I've heard my thoughts too long. It got to the point where my thoughts were going in so many directions, in so many wicked directions, that I didn't want to hear them. I just wanted God to speak. And right then, immediately, I knew I had to reach out to somebody. I felt like God was saying, I want to speak to you through another person. And so I'm like, okay, God, but who? And instantly, that goofball's face popped in my head. But even then, I was so distressed. I didn't want to reach out. There were two competing voices in my head. There was one that said, reach out because you know this is what God literally just told you to do. And the other that said, this guy is a father, a pastor, a husband. I don't want to burden him with my problems. Now, both voices were very convincing. It, led me in a, it left me in a standstill. I'm just sitting there like, God, give me the courage to reach out to Will because I don't know. And, if I, and then in the middle of that, I get a text. I don't even check it yet. But instantly, I start laughing. If you were there, you'd think I'm crazy. And I'm like, God, you didn't let me finish. Because <laughs> I already knew who it was. And I check, and it's Will. He texted me thanking me for just being on stage and reading the words I'd read. Something I forgot about because I hardly thought about it. And I opened up to him about what God was telling me to open up to him about. And through that, Satan lost such a big chunk of real estate that he had. Such a giant lie that was such a large part of my life had been defeated that day when I talked to Will. God was present for me even in the darkest of valleys. And I wrote that story down. I made sure I remind myself of that story many times because it's so easy to forget it. But next time I, fear, next time I face fear or anxiety or distress of any sort, that's what I want to remember. God's past provisions. And so fear is natural. Don't hate yourself if you're scared of things. We're all going to be scared of things. We're human. We're dumb sheep. And part of why it's natural is because hardship, dark valleys, giants are not just, you know, probably going to happen. They're guaranteed. <laughs> God literally calls us sheep among wolves. He said that's how he's going to send out his people. We will face persecutions of many kind, some for just living life and some for being Christian. And so, yeah, you can expect that kind of stuff. Fear will happen, but it's not the end of the story. Not only is God with us on earth as I hammered in your heads, but he promises life. The last two verses of the psalm are five and six. I'm going to read them again. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When Jesus ascended into heaven, what he told his disciples is that he prepares a room for us in his father's house. He's making heaven ready 
for us. When the verse says our cup or my cup overflows, that cup is God's grace. No matter how many times you mess up, God's grace abounds and overflows. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The footnote in the ESV study Bible said this could possibly be like a victory celebration with the enemies held captive. Can you imagine that? The very thing that just scared you is now powerless as you eat in celebration? And those enemies are not always just circumstances that we find ourselves in in the moment or people we don't like. But those enemies can be death, pain, sorrow. And even those enemies, God has already defeated. And so to end, we're all dumb sheep. And left on our own, we only ever end up hurting ourselves. But we don't have to be alone because God gave us Jesus, the Good Shepherd, and the Holy Spirit, who's always present to guide us to eternal life. Now, the road will not be easy, but if we keep our eyes off the valleys, off the giants, and on the God who can use even pebbles like us to take down giants, then we will find that fear no longer has a hold on us. And at the end of our journey, when we get to join the king in his great banquet, we get to hear the beautiful words of Jesus wash over us. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you. Thank you that you give me grace because I know, I know I need it. I got up here and called everybody stupid, <laughs> but you know I'm stupid too. I need a good shepherd and I'm thankful that you sent your son to be that shepherd. I'm thankful that you can use pebbles like myself to have such a glorious impact for your kingdom. Now use all of us, be with all of us, because we do have giants in our lives right now. We just thought about them a minute ago. The things we don't like thinking about God, you know they're there. And we cry out to you in our distress. God, please, give me peace and take down my giants. In those moments, not, help us not to forget what you have done previously, because you've done so much but help us to focus on what you will do in the future, what you will do in the present to the giants that think they have a chance against us. Be with every single one of us, God. Lead us. Be the good shepherd you've always been. It's in your matchless name that we pray. Amen. Amen.